It's now my pleasure to hand it over to Mike Hanfer, who is our Principal Strategic Development Manager. Take it away, Mike. I just want to make it clear, whatever you saw uh, Matt and Marjorie demonstrate today is in the latest version of Premiere that's publicly available. So all of you have access to the tools that you just saw. And uh, it's, it's just, it's a game changer. Uh, okay, so as a lead on our Hollywood team, my job involves working with directors, editors, and their post-production teams to support the use of our tools. One of my favorite groups to work with has been Team Fincher, and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our esteemed panelists. Please welcome Assistant Editor Jennifer Chung, First Assistant Editor Ben Insler, and Post Producer Peter Mavramades. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. I know you're all really busy, but it, it means so much to us and the students in the deck. Our pleasure. Hi. Hey, Hello. guys. So let's, let's get started here. Um, can each of you uh, describe your job responsibilities and, and how do they fit into the overall scheme of things? We can start with Jennifer, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so as an assistant editor, uh, my job is to support the editors and the entire editorial team throughout the post process from like prepping dailies into finishing. And so a big part of that is working as a liaison with other departments like sound and visual effects and color. Um, but our tasks really vary depending on where we're at in the post process. Um, and, and part of our responsibility is also setting up the workflow. And so our crew is a little different because we have the ability to work with the same people um, from show to show, which has really given us um, uh, the ability to expand and improve on our workflow instead of having to start from scratch and starting with like, you know, a completely new crew. Um, so, yeah, so that's something that Ben and Peter can can talk more about. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, uh, Jennifer really covered it. Uh, there's not, uh, in terms of interacting with departments and things like that, not much more that I personally do, um, except for the fact that uh, I may be a little bit more integrated in actually covering uh, the workflow and figuring out with Peter, with what everybody uh, wants to achieve with the technical look and feel of the movie, how that's gonna be supported and set up right from the beginning uh, of the production. Uh, and then, just like Jennifer said, uh, coordinating between multiple different departments, both inside our uh, number 13 team and outside vendors for VFX sound, uh, just making sure that everything flows smoothly uh, between all departments so that uh, editorial, uh, Kirk and David can work uh, as precisely as they need to and efficiently together, uh, and then that everything passes out to the other departments and then back in. Um, because we do a back and forth sort of round tripping process that needs to be seamless. So we may send a cutout for a sound mix and then decide to make some edit changes, uh, but we want to make those edit changes with the sound mix. We're not working where we left off and then having sound mix start over. So it's really just making sure that all that falls into place so that everybody can work as smoothly as possible. Peter, you are the senior member, the leader at number 13, leader of the troops. Um, tell us what you do. Um, I have to, uh, at, at the very beginning, what I'm doing is I'm working with the producers to come up with a schedule and a, and a budget for, for wh what we need to get done and when we need to get it done by. And then when we're uh, in the thick of it, I have to make sure that we arrive at certain milestones uh, right on time. So while Jennifer and Ben and the others are on the front lines doing battle in the trenches, I got to make sure that that you know next week we are at a certain point, or that the effects is handed off, or that uh, color tests have been happening on time, so that uh, people on the set uh, are happy with uh, what they've been shooting. And so um, I'm keeping sort of a more global view of what's going on, and uh, you know keeping my eye on the prize of uh, when everything is due. A lot of responsibility there. So. Um... Look, as many of you students and teachers already know, a, a huge factor in, in success in your career when working with film, it's all about relationships and making connections. Uh, you just never know how one thing's gonna end up leading to the next. So I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to tell you an interesting story. It's a long story, so I'll try to make it sort of quick. Uh, Peter, 
you and I go way, way back. Now you guys are gonna get an idea of how old we really are. I met Peter in 1982. We were both working at Newbies in commercials and music video production in New York at a company called Charlex. And then uh, things happen, you know, we each got started in our careers. We were doing different things at that company. Uh, Peter was producing and running the stage. Uh, I got involved with uh, motion control and camera work and all that sort of stuff. But cut to 16 years later, in 1998, we worked together again on the visual effects for Fight Club, the legendary Fight Club. You were post-production supervising for Fincher, and I was with Digital Domain at the time. I was their film imaging supervisor. And it was just kind of great, even back then, to get back together and you know work at a different company doing all different things. And uh, Carl, if uh, you could put up that slide that we have there. This is sort of midway through my history lesson for today. Um, so I joined Adobe 15 years ago in 2005. And in 2009, again, sort of reconnected with Peter and what he was up to, uh, I got word of this very young and tech savvy assistant editor, Tyler Nelson, who we actually saw at the beginning of that video that we kicked off the event with. Uh, and he had come up with an experimental process to bring an entire Final Cut 7 timeline into After Effects. And Final Cut 7 were what Angus Wall and Kirk Baxter were cutting their films with at, at that time. And uh, Tyler figured out a way to take the timeline of the film and routing it through Premiere Pro using an EDL, he was able to use it to translate it into After Effects and actually created this humongous After Effects project that literally had every shot in the movie as a separate layer in the timeline. It, I had never seen anything like it. And when we told the people at, at Adobe about it, they were just like, that's impossible. I can't believe you could do that. But they did. And that is actually how um, on the left here, you see the social network, that was the first film using that process where it was edited in Final Cut and then conformed completely in After Effects, put, put together for a final all the way to the stage before it was uh, digitally color corrected for DI. So again, the same, um, same very similar workflow on Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, uh, but yet it wasn't using uh, any Adobe tool to do the editing, it was using our other tools sort of as a Swiss Army knife and to do opticals and speed changes and screens, things like that. Uh, but then, um, you know, a big moment for Adobe came uh, in 2013. This was it. You know, the spotlight was on Adobe. It was, you know, now or never, do or die, make this work. So we uh, convinced Team Fincher that we were ready with Premiere. And just as a little test, they cut a Calvin Klein commercial that David Fincher directed, Kirk Baxter edited. Uh, it's up here, a second from the left. And it was, um, it was a success, and it gave them enough confidence to say, hey, you know what, we think you guys are ready to edit a feature film. Gone Girl is yours, and hopefully it's all going to work out. So Gone Girl came out in 2014. It was a really great experience. We learned so much in that, and it put us on the map with our first studio feature edited exclusively in Premiere Pro. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. A couple of seasons of Netflix's Mindhunter came next which is a fabulous series if you haven't seen it. Uh, it was how the FBI learned to profile serial killers and just really masterfully done. Uh, and then here we are, uh, like cut to 2019, the Premier Productions uh, feature, which was demonstrated earlier that you saw from Matt and Marjorie, that's the core editorial workflow for Team Fincher on their latest masterpiece, which was Mank, uh, which is gonna be streaming on Netflix on December 4th. and uh, Peter, we've got the trailer queued up, but can you introduce Mank? Tell us what it's about, and then we'll take a look at the trailer. Great. Uh, Mank uh, is uh, the nickname that they use to call Herman Mankiewicz, who's one of the co-writers of uh, Citizen Kane. Um, everybody knows Orson Welles' uh, involvement in Citizen Kane, but many people don't know uh, Herman Mankiewicz's involvement. And uh, this is a... a a writer, screenwriter in the 30s who is considered a genius by many, yet led a very troubled life. And so uh, that is the, uh, the core of our story and, and specifically about the writing of Citizen Kane. And Herman Mankiewicz had a brother named Joe Mankiewicz who went on for, to, to an incredible career. But uh, Herman Mankiewicz was, as I said, a troubled soul, which you'll learn about in the movie. 
Oh, excellent. Uh, we just can't wait to see this. So, uh, Carl, would you please roll the trailer? I'm, I'm just so excited and really, really proud of you guys. I mean, um, just to think how privileged you're getting to work on a film like this. Uh, and we're so happy that we were able to help out. Um, what, what I'm just loving is uh, the reviews are, are stellar and, uh, you know, seeing lot, lots and lots of Oscar buzz. Um, I saw a funny comment in, in the um, chat pod where a gentleman said something like, the first rule about Mank is you don't talk about Mank. Uh, and uh, sort of along those lines, uh, you know, the movie hasn't debuted yet. And, um, you know, yet Netflix was kind enough to let us talk about it in the workflow. Uh, so we're going to uh, take a little bit of a look on how Ben set up the production for that. We can't dive too deep, but I think you'll get an idea where you'll see the foundation that Matt and Marjorie laid out, how it, how it applies actually in, in, a, in a real film. So uh, Ben, how'd you organize the premiere production that contained that trailer project, which is a part of the, the film itself, a gigantic production? Uh, that the trailer lies within. Yeah, let me share my screen here for a second and I'll show you guys. All right, everybody should be able to uh, see a layout of our uh, Adobe Premiere window set. Uh, is everybody seeing that? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay. Uh, this is sort of the general layout. We'll dive in a little bit, um, but as you can see, you know, this is our whole production running. That is the uh, trailer timeline there for the trailer that you just saw, uh, and you can see right over here that we have our trailer editing project open, and right over here we have the production window that uh, Matt was explaining to you guys a little bit earlier. Um, we actually normally work with three monitors. This is a two monitor setup. We have a third monitor that is actually vertical, so we can actually see a much longer listing of everything that's in our projects, everything that's in our production, even a, a whole length of, of markers throughout a whole uh, sequence, just so we can get a little bit more scope of things. Uh, but since we're all working from home, uh, currently on two monitors, or at least I am. Uh, if we take a little bit of a closer look at that monitor on the left there, uh, you can see that there's the trailer project on the right, uh, right here, and here is the premiere production. Uh, the premiere production is really organized very much the same way that Matt detailed, uh, where we have um, everything organized into uh, bins that contain, or folders that contain individual projects where uh, those projects are cross-referencing media from each other. So if we open up the Reels folder here, um, you can see that the trailer is actually being edited inside of the very same production where everything else is available. And one of the benefits of this uh, with XREF that Matt detailed is that we can actually go and grab media from pretty much anywhere as we're uh, thinking about it and put it straight into the trailer project without the trailer project, which you can see over here on the right, becoming incredibly large by starting to contain duplicates of all that media. Um, and we don't have to worry about media getting sort of scattered throughout multiple different edit projects and figuring out where things may be linking to what media and what media is the right media. Do we already have that in a project? Do, you know, it, it gets very complicated when you don't have cross references. And so uh, XREF and the productions help us organize that. Um, if I jump to the next slide, which just opens up uh, a little bit more of our production organization, um, you can see that right here adjacent to uh, the trailer project is all the scenes of the movie. Uh, and in there, are projects for every single scene in the movie. Uh, this has obviously been edited a little bit <laughs> for the titles, if you can read those. Um, but uh, right there, we have scenes one, two, three, four. And if we want to put something from scene one into the trailer, uh, we can go into uh, the movie and grab it. We can go right back to the dailies and uh, review what we need to review so that the trailer can get edited exactly as uh, we want without having to go and hunt uh, extensively or across multiple projects. Um, I know Matt mentioned save times and open times. This allows things to open and close very, very quickly uh, so that we can really jump back and forth and keep editing rather than hunting, uh, which is a lot of what we do is finding the right thing. Um, let's take a look here. I'm gonna zoom back out. This just 
is sort of a bigger example of uh, taking scope on the whole production uh, that is adjacent to the trailer um, and available to us while we're in the trailer. And uh, I just wanted to show this last slide here, which shows uh, what we call a Z-Assist folder, which is not something exclusive uh, to our workflow. A lot of people use this. Um, but you can see in the previous slide that, or if I go back a few, that um, the collection of items in our production looks very small. Um, and that's because we actually try to contain uh, what is visible and at the root of the production to what is really needed during editing by Kirk. We don't want the production, because production like this is so vast, we don't want uh, to create a lot of clutter for him to actually have to sort through. We want Kirk to be able to find what he needs to find. And then myself, Jennifer, um, Russell, Casey, all the people on our, on our assistant editing team, uh, we keep everything in the Z Assist folder so that we know where everything is and can find it. Um, obviously, Kirk can go in there as well and find whatever he needs, but he doesn't have to actually see it all the time. So if I jump back to that slide, you can see that there's a lot of additional detail in there, footage that's been colored by our DI team, uh, visual effects that have been completed, and we actually even have uh, working folders for all the assistants. Um, just for fun, because I know everybody likes to look at timelines, um, since we can't really talk about Mank now, because the first rule of Mank is you don't talk about Mank, uh, I brought in a timeline from Mindhunter. And this actually coincides with some of the demos we're going to do in a minute. Uh, but this is a full hour, nine minute timeline uh, from Mindhunter. And uh, in terms of the way we work, you can see a lot of stacking there. Um, we actually work in a very targeted editing way where uh, the clips are actually really only down there on V1 and V2. And all of the additional color stacking that you see is actually VFX and other elements that have been fed in over the top as work is completed. And uh, as we do that, you can see it gets a little complex. And uh, that's it. All right. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great seeing a, a practical application. I mean, you see the complexity on a large film, yet it also, having the access to productions, greatly simplified uh, some of the things in the workflow to the point where it just becomes that much more efficient for all you guys to work together. So, and I, I will say, I will say, we worked with you guys uh, when we were working on Mindhunter on an iteration where we had XREF, but we didn't have the productions available yet. You guys at Adobe were still developing that. Um, the productions help in that everything then stays contained within the production, rather than essentially jumping between Premiere and the Finder. Uh, yeah. So that has allowed us to just sort of stay in editing mode rather than editing and file management mode. Yeah, and I just want to mention, you know, having you guys uh, many times literally as guinea pigs trying things at the same moment that they're coming out of engineering, literally like hours later sometimes, or, uh, you know, showing you something and then then getting one of your five-page emails that are just <laughs> richly detailed on exactly how you'd love to see it. Um, that, you like that, getting emails that say there's a new build. <laughs> That is exactly how uh, we love to work and, and what got us all here today. We wouldn't be having this conversation without doing that type of R&D with you guys. So thank you again, especially for all your patience through the years and helping to make things great. Um, thank you for making stuff for us so quickly. 